throughout today that you are loved and you are accepted here in this place. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for holy worship.
presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. The charms of God into a pool of water, the flint into the spring of water. Our gospel lesson this morning, um, our epistle lesson, excuse me, is from Romans 14, 1 through 12. Welcome the people, the person who is weak in faith but not in order to argue about differences of opinion. One person believes in eating everything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Those who eat must not look down on the ones who don't, and the ones who don't eat must not judge the ones who do, because God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servants? They stand or fall before their own Lord, and they will stand because the Lord has the power to make them stand. One person considers some days to be more sacred than others, while another person considers all the days to be the same. Each person must have their own convictions. Someone who thinks that a day is sacred thinks that way for the Lord. Those who eat, eat for the Lord, because they thank God. And those who don't eat, don't eat for the Lord, and they thank the Lord too. We don't live for ourselves, and we don't die for ourselves. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to God. This is why Christ died and lived, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you look down on your brother or sister? We, will, we all will stand in front of the judgment seat of God. Because it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will give praise to God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves <coughs> to God. This is the word of God, God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do I have any children who want to come forward at this time? <coughs> Last week we talked about up there. Um, for the big people, we talked about forgiveness. Do you know what forgiveness is? Forgiveness. If, if, um, I did something against Pastor Jeremy. If I did something like I, he had his special uh, book of pictures, and, and I went and I took it from him. That's not right. Either. And 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 he got mad at me for doing that. Um, what, what do you, somebody has to forgive a person, and and there's forgiveness. Sort of makes it right. So I have to give it back, I have to give it back. But he's still angry with me because I took it without asking. But he's got a book of pictures back. But then he would have to say, I forgive you, right? And I, I have to forgive you. And we have to come together. We have to shake hands. That's what it is, shake hands. Sort of like Woody and, and uh, who, Woody's buddy, uh, Buzz. Woody and Buzz, they kind of shook hands and said, Everything's cool, right? Right? right. They did, I think. They got together. Did you? Did you? Did they shake hands? Did everything go all right? That's what Jesus is asking us to do with our brothers and sisters. With everybody we're, we're close to, especially here. To, to shake hands and say, hey, I'm sorry if I hurt you. And the other person says, it's okay. It's okay. Shake hands. And Jesus.
there. We'll come back to verse 5 after the gospel reading. And let us remain standing for the gospel reading according to St. Matthew. It says, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and his children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, I, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants, who owed him 500 denarii, and seized him by the throat and said, Pay what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into the prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of us if we do not forgive our brother and sister from our heart. This is the word of God for the people of God.
But if you remember nothing else from today, remember this. This is the whole point of the story. Catherine Ryan High, you might remember the name, you might not, but she expands upon her experience she had one night stranded by the side of the road on the interstate highway. It'd be sort of like on 95 or 85. Uh, she envisions what it would look like if someone did a favor for her, something really big, something that she could not do on her own. Instead of paying it back, she was able to pay it forward. Remember? Remember the little boy in the story, Pay It Forward? The, the movie, the little boy that said, uh, I'm going to do one nice thing for someone and they'll do something else for somebody else and they'll do something else for somebody else. And on and on it goes. Well, in that movie, Pay It Forward, it begins with a stranger, a transient wanderer, a scruffy man, stumbles across a bridge, obviously in a hurry to his next stop. He's got his bag slung over his shoulder. He's got a, a, a scruffy beard. He's a little dirty from the walk. But as he makes his way across the bridge, he notices a middle-class woman staring over the side of the bridge, crying, about to jump. And he calls out to her immediately. Hey, lady, it can't be that bad. The woman startled, throws her purse at him and says, here, take it, but, but get away from me. He, he pleads with her, I'm not going to hurt you. She steps out further, climbing over the rail of the bridge. She says, get away from me. You, you wouldn't understand, she says. The guy says, come on, lady. Almost sarcastically, he says, look at me. You think I hang out with the rich? A few minutes ago, I couldn't think of anywhere else but how to get my next fix. But then I saw you, and that changed everything. The lady turns with a confused look on her face. She says, why are you doing this? The man gently responds, extending his hand toward the woman, because I owe someone a favor. He said, because I owe someone a favor. Come on, let's go get a cup of coffee and save my life. That's what he said. Peter seems a bit unsatisfied with the way the recent conversation about forgiveness and reconciliation had been left in the previous chapter, Matthew 18. And maybe like us in a way, he wants Jesus to define it more uh, purposeful, purposefully. He, he wants this sacred struggle of love um, to, to be filled in. So Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, a great ruler ruled over his kingdom with contentment and security. And during the annual review of accounts, that's Methodist words for an audit. You know, the Methodists have this annual review. It makes it sound a little bit easier on the church. Uh, but the annual review, he was doing a, uh, it, it appeared that one of his managers was embezzling large amounts of money from the king's central fund. The audit revealed about 9 million ounces of gold were extracted from the treasury over a certain period of time. It wasn't all at once. It never is. And the, the wrongs that we continue kind of accumulate over time, and especially this wrong that this manager was doing, and, you know, I don't know what gold is trading at now, but a little while ago it was 431 an ounce, so, you know, 9 million ounces at 431 would probably be an almost $4 billion. 3.8, whatever. After the proper investigation, <coughs> the manager was asked to pay back this fund. Whew. However, the manager, as to your surprise, had squandered this money over the period of time that he was taking it. It always happens that we, you know, we always tend to squander the things that we do over time. We don't realize it accumulates. And this man could not possibly repay what he had taken dishonestly. He couldn't pay back his debt, and not this lifetime, 
In no way, no how. The king was furious, and rightly so, but he ordered the bureaucrats and his family and everything they owned to be sold and applied to the debt. Of course, upon hearing this, the king's command, the guilty manager fell on his face and begged for mercy. Be patient, he pleaded. I promise I'll pay back everything. The sight of the whimpering man moved the king to pity. In spite of the king's loss, the king forgave the debt and let the man go free, just like that. Relieved, the manager <coughs> left the office and went immediately to his own office where he picks up the phone and he calls his co-worker in, who had just recently, probably two or three weeks ago, borrowed $5,000 from him to get a car for his daughter who was going back and forth to school and to work. And the manager, the guilty man, um, wanted this guy to come in and, and he was going to tell him it's time to pay up. Wait a minute. Well, this co-worker of the manager decided, he said, he pleads with him, he said, I'll pay you back. You know, 5,000 is a little bit easier to pay back than 4 billion. So, you know, you can see a little difference in his begging and pleading really might have been for real. And he was, um, but the manager would have none of it. He grabbed this guy by the throat and said, you pay back now, or we would throw him in jail. He says, I, I can't do it now. I'll give you a couple weeks. I can come up with the money somewhere. The manager winds up throwing him in jail. It didn't take long before the office gossip had gotten back up the way to the, to the head boss of campus. You know, with emails and Facebook and LinkedIn and all this social media nowadays, it goes like wildfire. I mean, it goes all over the place within seconds. And the king was at the manager's door within a couple minutes by lunchtime, knocking on that door. And the manager is surprised, what brings you down here to these parts, boss, he says, you, you should have extended mercy like I did to you, but now that you have not, I canceled all the debt because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have shown mercy to your own co-worker? In anger, the man's boss not only turned him over to the jailers, but it says in there, it says he had him tortured. It says, it's not only tortured, uh, I, I think there's some wiggle room here. It says that, in the anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. That word tortured troubles me. It troubles me, that the, now the common New English says he turned him over to the jailer responsible for punishing prisoners. It seems to me that the king, who represents God in the parable, the parable, we all know that, has gone back on his forgiveness. And what I remember from Sunday school or from the basic lessons of the Bible is that God never goes back on his forgiveness. Maybe it troubles me because it reminds me of how relational the experience of forgiveness must be. Forgiveness is a process. It is an ongoing, continual part of our life that cannot be left in the hands of one person controlling the responses of another. It can't be left in my hands saying to someone, you need to forgive that person. You need to forgive that person. You need to forgive me. No, 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 no. Forgiveness is an experience that moves both parties, both participants, everyone together in compassion and patience to mercy. That's what troubles me. Forgiveness must allow us to experience a movement of mercy filling our hearts with compassion. The sacred struggle of love challenges me 
to respond with patience, to, to let that patience grow, seeking understanding. If we can't forgive others, we will be tortured in ourselves. Because what happens is that if we can't forgive others, we become <coughs> tortured by the searching to make the ways right ourselves. And that's never going to happen. And we become tortured and tormented in our hearts and in our spirits to make others pay back what they owe us. And then I figure, you know, treating others differently than the way God has treated me, that sets up a dichotomy and they bump into one another and therein lies the rub. In other words, the mercy that God has shown us will be lost if we do not share it with others. If we do not extend the patience of a merciful heart to others, then we continue to live with the unrestful agitation that invalidates the compassionate heart shown to us. See, because God has already shown us patience and love and forgiven us our huge debt from the past. And if I can't understand that and I can't get that in my heart, then it stops. It goes no further than me. And therefore, it doesn't extend to others. And that's, that's the torture. The torture is within us. And it's so interesting because I find it more life-giving to myself and others to seek ways to keep mercy alive or to keep the compassionate heart growing and paying it forward than trying to get somebody to pay back what they owe for something they did weeks or maybe years or maybe decades ago. Accepting the joyful mercy of our gracious Father's patient heart fills us with compassion for others and gives life to everyone in this sacred struggle for resolution and peace. In other words, the manager from our story never fully accepted the compassion found in the patient heart. He never really understood what this huge forgiveness meant. Never fully understanding the mercy of the king, he went and tried to resolve the conflict himself instead of letting God be invited into our lives and into the hearts of all those who are involved. And if you have a better way, please let me know because I'm struggling just as much as you are. With an impatient heart, when my heart is impatient with my life, I'm more agitated with others. Is that not right? I mean, if our hearts are not, are not patient, it only irritates other circumstances that are going on. And this manager only irritated his own circumstances and disturbed the life of his co-worker in his own quest for self-righteousness, for a self-righteous resolution. God has extended a gracious, merciful heart to us in Jesus Christ. Are we searching to settle our own situations that struggle for love? I mean, because 20 years ago, I can tell you some stuff. Are we tangled in our own web of our own debts because we will not let God's mercy fill us with compassion for others? Do we hang on to things we have done in the past, making someone else pay us back because we haven't understood what has been done graciously for us in our lives? <coughs> maybe it is difficult for us to be filled with compassion and show mercy to others because we are impatient with our own lives. God shows us great patience in Jesus Christ. And maybe that's why God is portrayed as the kind of merciful king that forgives huge amounts of debt. 
a mercy and compassion that begins in God's heart, that begins from his heavenly throne to us, is that we might increase the mercy here with others. God's purpose flourishes as we pay it forward and allow the mercy and compassion to magnify God's holy name. And forgiving those who trespass against us is probably the most difficult thing that I think we as Christians in the 21st century are asked to do. It's a challenge to see the joy of a compassionate heart as we release those. Forgiveness is not something that we control in ourselves. It's something we accept from God. And forgiveness is something that frees our own hearts from the torture that entangles us in the lifespan of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Where does it stop? How many tooth can we, teeth can we keep giving away? Where does it stop? Reciprocity never ends. That's why I think God wants us to trade back and forth merciful hearts than the violent acts against one another. If we continue to trade and exchange merciful hearts, it would grow. But the entire point of forgiveness is to settle the account. Isn't that what he, the king started out with? He wanted to settle accounts. That means, that means that's it. It's over. Lay it down. Put it right here. And let God take it. Let Jesus take it to heaven where it will be abolished forever. And, and the thing is that if we, if we could do that so easily, we'd all be in this peaceful world. But that's the struggle. Settling the accounts for me says it's over. We lay it down. We walk away from the struggle. The struggle to get along with one another and the struggle to love God. However, we know that Jesus does not leave us to be tortured in our own prison, in our own hearts to be tormented. The sacred struggle of sin is reconciled. The separation from God is restored in the life of Jesus. God gives us the patient heart of Jesus, filled with the compassion and mercy. Yes, Jesus challenges us this morning to pay it forward. What is the it? The it is the forgiveness that we receive from God's mercy. We're supposed to pay that forward. And what I said at the early service was that maybe, just maybe, if you've got something back here in your life that's against somebody, Maybe if we pay forward this loving mercy to, a, to others up here, that, that through living that mercy up here with others, we would come to learn and maybe understand and maybe give it over to this situation back here in our lives. But as God has come in Jesus to show us a merciful life, to show us the grace and compassion and love, that's what we're to pay for. Let it go. Walk forward with Jesus into the peace and resolution that he wants for all of us through his love.
praise you, God of steadfast faithfulness. And we open our souls before you now and for all our lives. Help us to put our fullest trust in you and acclaim you as our help and strength. We pray today for those whose lives are wracked by grief and loss, that you would reveal your abiding presence and restore broken hearts. You made the heaven and the earth, the seas and all that is in them. Give food to those who hunger and justice to those who are oppressed. You are the freedom of all your people, the strength of all who are weary, the healing of all who are sick. We pray for those who suffer and seek your help. We pray especially today for widows, immigrants, and those who are without homes or families. Gather your people together and create a community of love once again. Lord, your grace and love reign forever, and your promises with us throughout all the ages. We bring these, to you, these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Since we met him, our life has no longer been the same. Um, we remember uh, our announcements also this week. Um, I'm not going to read them to you, but we have. Could the ushers please come forward as we worship the Lord with our tithe and offering? Thank you. 
we sing the last hymn, Chris, while you're in line, um, wanted me to let you all know that there'll be a 10-minute meeting after worship this morning for the backpack team. They've got something they have to tell you. Something more they have to tell you. So 10 minutes after worship, where they're going to meet? Fellowship Hall. Fellowship Hall for the backpack ministry teams. Jesus Christ, the blessing of the Holy Spirit. 